audience to please settle down. This is a poetry session, and I think that we ought to respect the fact that we are in the lap of the gods. We have three poets from different parts of the world. Sinan Antun, who is an award-winning poet, novelist, and a literary translator and scholar. His early education was in Baghdad, after which he proceeded to Georgetown University and Harvard University. He's published four novels and two poetry collections in his, in his native language, Arabic, and one poetry collection in English. He's currently um, an associate professor at the New York University. And then, of course, there is Ben Oakley. There is no, of course, about Ben Oakley. <laughs> An internationally acclaimed poet and novelist, Oakley is one of Africa's continent's leading writers, and his first novel, Flowers and Shadows, was published at the age when he was 21 years old. He then went on, subsequently, to win the Booker Prize for The Famished Road, and was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 2001. He is currently an honorary vice president of the English Center of International PEN and a member of the board of the Royal National Theatre, in addition to serving as the vice president of the Kane Prize for African Writing. Finally, we have Salman Tariq Qureshi, who has been <coughs> writing for many years now. He's a very experienced practitioner, and his poetry has been widely anthologized in Pakistan. And um, in particular, he wanted me to mention Landscapes of the Mind, which was published in 1998. Um, Blue Wind and the Legacy of the Indus. These were different anthologies in which his work has appeared. He is a man of many parts. Um, a poet, short story writer, a business executive, a newspaper feature writer, and of course, a poet. So we uh, welcome gentlemen. to suggest that we imagine for a moment that W. H. Auden revised his mind, changed his mind, and said that poetry does make something happen. That's something that one can perhaps consider. I think these gentlemen here are happenings and the other uh, notion I want you to think about is the redress of poetry. Does poetry offer redress? And keeping those two ideas, those two thoughts in mind. Um, Sinan, would you like to demonstrate to us the redress? Yes, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all. I'm, I'm really happy and honored to be here. I will be reading a few poems. Um, the first, I, I don't like to preface poems, but it has something to do with the Mesopotamian mythology about the underworld, what happens to the dead after they die. In the Mesopotamian myths, they, they go into the underworld and they roam. So it's called a postcard from the underworld. I have never seen the sun. It does not rise here. My father saw it there before his death. He tells me about it all the time, about its ever-burning flames. Like a candle, he said, lit by the gods, 
never to be extinguished, like the one I am holding now, here. He taught me how to put these bodies back together, to cover them with feathers so they could roam the darkness. Sometimes an arm or a leg remains. I put it in the corner and wait for the piles they bring the next day. I will ask my father about the eye he hung on the wall a week ago. It is still shedding tears. I wonder if it is longing for its sister or for the son. The next one is called The Poet. The poet is another Noah. He spends a lifetime building an ark of words, filling it with metaphors and clouds. His solitude amassed, but he makes sure there is enough silence in the skeleton so that water seeps into his own and it slowly sinks until it rests on the bottom of the sea. I should say these poems are originally written in Arabic and translated into English. And uh, many of them were written in the previous years when there has been a lot of war and destruction and dismemberment in Iraq and Syria and Palestine and a lot of places. So this next one is, uh, uh, is dark. It's called dismemberment. The body, or a voice impersonating it, said, Go. As of now, you are all free. The eyes flew far away, joining flocks of other eyes, which had filled the sky, almost blocking the sunlight. The lips parted company without a farewell. One searched for a new face the other for a lip that would listen to its complaints. The tired tongue sought a mute man's mouth to rest in. The hands clapped and waved to each other as they went away. The right leg appeared to be frightened and hesitant. And then it rushed to catch up with the left leg. The nose fell on the ground and so on and so forth. As for the heart, it kept beating alone until a lost foot crushed it. The next poem is called A Letter to Al Mutanabbi. And Al Mutanabbi is a 10th century poet, was one of the greatest classical Arab poets. And a, a street after him was named in Baghdad. It was the street at the heart of the old city where the, it was the cultural center of the city with lots of bookshops and stalls uh, and a famous cafe for the literati uh, where they met every Friday. On March 5th, 2007, a bomb exploded, killing 26 civilians and destroying many of the bookshops. So the, the letter is to al Mutanabi the poet, and to al Mutanabi the street. You were right. Your words are still wings of light, always carrying you to us sometimes carrying us to you. And your name is a green tattoo on Baghdad's tired face. Your street of forehead of a body beheaded every morning. Just another chapter in the saga of blood and ink you knew so well. I cannot lie to you. I am quite pessimistic. We are still etching on the walls of this cave, which is thousands of years long, signs we keep reinterpreting, and myths about a future world where we don't devour one another, where the sun is friendly and the seas cannot inherit our fever. Some of us are digging a deeper grave, about to embrace us all. They too have their engravings, maps, philosophers and books. We can only keep dreaming of a shore for the wind and dig wells in the dark with nails of silence and solitude. We will weave an ocean out of ink for our myths and out of words a sail or a shroud vast enough for us all. 
Every book is a well around which we sit and drink to your health and try to live like you did with death and after it. Thank you. The next one is called Things Heard on New Year's Eve. One war to another. May you never tire and may we go on forever. One book to its neighbor, hoping someone will remember us and his fingers will touch our leaves to rouse us from this dust. One tree to another. I hope we stay together. And if a saw were to break our backs, may our remains stay close, perhaps two chairs around an elegant table, one cloud to another. Are you tired of traveling? No worries. Soon we'll sleep in the sea. The sea to itself. I am bored of these shores and everyone on them. I wish I could become a cloud and fly away. Autumn in heaven. Trees are evergreen. Gentle winds tickle their branches. The elders read newspapers. Children play. Their mothers watching. But there are whispers that another angel committed suicide last night. Um, just a few more ones. This is called Wars. When I was torn by war, I took a brush immersed in death and drew a window on the wall of this war. I opened it searching for something. But all I saw was another war and a mother weaving a shroud for the dead man still in her womb. And uh, I don't know, I didn't time myself. I think I have time for a few more. Okay. Um, untitled. And then the day came when the earth was spent and overbled, it lost its gravity. Three leaves stopped falling. Dead birds, too. Their corpses kept flying up in the gray sky, which had become a colossal screen of the underworld. Psalm. In the beginning was the stab. The dagger made the wound in its own image, and then it went away, looking for another body. The wound wept for 40 days, then it healed. It became a heart and crawled away, looking for another body. Thank you.
spiritually far beyond the mesh of time. Light that blazes through the darkened domain of power. That impulse to tear down shackles of the soul put there to make us bend to fear and control. Prometheus's first cry and his enduring gift. Meaning of myth when it is decoded as fire and light. Prima materia that changes black earth of suffering into the red dragon of bold overcoming. Last flame of a defeated people, first kindler of their resurrection. Yellow path up to the crowned mountain where destiny, mind forged, becomes the green ladder to the lanterned heaven heavens. Secret song of flowers and beauty's torch. My mother's injunction and my father's revelation. next one is called a Shakespeare portrait. <coughs> Some time ago, the National Gallery asked a couple of poets to choose a, a famous person who's been um, enshrined in the National Portrait Gallery to write a poem about. And ridiculously, unwisely, I chose Shakespeare. <laughs> a Shakespeare portrait. <clears throat> you whose mind awakens endless generations. Why is your true face so unknown and unknowable? As if you wish to conceal your mole that you may reveal that which flows from your soul to ours through the inconstancy of words which bring forth from changing times immortal truths that justice, in secret, may prevail. A balancing hand runs through all civilizations. Something mysterious ebbs and flows in the sea of lives. You show one of the faces of the sea in your hidden face. But with your dreams, we stand as one dreamer in the tempest and the dust. To know your face is not to guess your work. To see your face is not to imagine your work. Your face is a mask behind which the unknown master smiles. That's because nobody really knows what Shakespeare looks like. <laughs> Gazing at the shape of a hill, the gray horizon, a woman reading a book, a landscape shaped by history, all we do is story. Our public acts are dreams. Our private acts are dramas. Submerged rivers are our thoughts. Misted streams are hopes. Like the spider, we turn all things into ourselves. We bend the light of time into fables. Beyond our mind, reality moves, unknowable like the darkness of creation. We carve from the unknown a world. Without story, our identities starve. We live in and 
out of time simultaneously. <coughs> Living belongs to story. Being belongs to mystery. Beyond form, our souls breathe. We yield time our story-making sense. In this portion of eternity, awake and in dreams, we live myths. It's what makes us immense. It feels odd to look long at a corpse or a leaf. It disturbs one's belief. I found it hard to see my mother's face. The more I looked, the more her face eluded me. I see her perfectly in dreams or when I don't try. Then, long afterwards, I wonder why I suddenly cry. When you go to the seaside, at first you can't look at the sea or the horizon for too long. Then, with time, it's like getting to know a strange song. Whether it be faces, flowers, horizons, something of the real is touched with a haze. Reality resists the gaze. This is the weakness of the iPad. You have to be sequential about this. You have to scroll down with the book. Just yeah, but these are poems that are not in any books. These are. What I'd like to talk to you about is, uh, is for me the important difference between poetry and prose. Um, and one of those differences is that, is that uh, I think the poetry of soul sings more directly. Um, and with prose, it has to rely so much. direct forms. The poem I'm going to read is, is a poem called Revolution. Revolutions are hard to find. And here it is. <coughs> they live as if everything is settled. dreams, nor our fears, nor the boundary between things. The land is not settled, nor the realm of sleep, nor the deep mines where our fathers weep, nor the deep wells where our mothers call out our names. When the world, when in the world of sharks and guns, we wonder where the leaves caress the red wind. Those fences of steel rising high beyond the clouds never kept out the eyes of hunger that wander the world like thunder. Those armed guards with iron teeth and stony eyes that devour the poor with a cold gaze. Those invisible hovels and those tower blocks, those men who live on dust and sleep on stones, their bodies turning gray with the night rains and the rust, those mothers with their teeth falling out from mercury in their food, those children whose lungs 
will not carry them through the streets of the liveless city. What do they know of boundaries? What do they know of the gods of the streets and the gods of hunger? Nothing is settled. Not our place in the world or our place among the dead. The rich have not locked up all the dreams or hopes of the power that grows in rage. A generation lives on dust and debris and are as pale as ghosts. But the god of hunger powers their bodies with the secret electricity that drives the galaxies and the entropy that swings abundance into the, a potent emptiness. On the edge of cities, they swell and grow. Their only education is the text of truth, without which the world delivers us every day without humor. Nothing is settled. Those who think they will inherit the earth because they have mortgaged the sun will find on the eve of their usurpation that the green horsemen are on the horizon. The earth shifts and howls. The sands have turned into people. The graves speak lucid prophecies. There is nothing to inherit because nothing is settled except the thunder after sleep. Excellent. I will say that it's, we need a new compassion in politics. Um, a new compassion um, that's linked with um, a sense of truth um, and, and the courage to speak for the poor without ignoring the rich. Um, so annoyed I can't find the poem. Do you have the poem with you? Do you have the poem with you? Maybe I'll come to that point later on. I can't find it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do, but it's like in a broken form. Oh, no, we don't want broken forms no. here. <laughs> <laughs> like one stanza sounds there and the other one sounds there. Okay, since I can't find it, I'll read something else in this place. Is that okay? Maybe if I find it later, I'll read it. Sure. Um, this poem I've been working on for some time. It's not entirely finished, but... <coughs> um, Sometimes sharing an unfinished poem helps it be finished. Um, it's called the Rohingyas. The hammer of the army beats down on them. The laws of the state dispossess them. The eagles that feed on the liver of time devours them. Icons of justice betray them. They are scattered in their thousands across borders and boundaries, and no one speaks for them. No one weeps at the rape of them. The laws say they cannot buy lands in their own land. They are dispossessed of citizenship in the place where they are natural citizens. They are the image of powerlessness in our time, the image of vulnerability of the peaceful way, <coughs> in a time when everything moves by force and violence, and a religion of light dealing in darkness. Somewhere on the edge of the world where the center howls its hollowness, a race of men and women are perishing. The world, it seems, has been good at being deaf. The planet screams, women are raped, men are crushed, and tyranny 
bursts at its seams. <coughs> Freedom's hand, bloody and broken, is compromised by the feasting on hearts in the towers. It seems there are two worlds. In one, pipelines give immunity. Tanks and guns break the flesh in the shadow of humanity. In the other, blood runs fresh. Skulls are broken on the pavements of history. And nations preserve their equanimity in this creeping silence that is a mystery. Can you watch a man being flayed alive in the open wound of the streets? Can you watch tanks crush human feet? And the religion of peace dealing in agony. This silence is a mystery. terminating this or the other life by no design. An automatic rifle spits nearly a hundred bullets a minute. It is negligent of what gets in the way, old, tin can, old oil cans or someone's face, leg or chest, or a straight cat. It's as straightforward as that. Okay, this is a longish one, and uh, it's much more personal, as you see as I read it. It's called Death of a Prominent Citizen in Memoriam E. K. There, five or six parts. First part, obsequies. He was honored by the city he'd loved and made his home. Three former chief secretaries, the entire staff of the museum, relatives, acquaintances, children, grandchildren, commemorated his obsequies. Newspapers fattened a feature, feature page with all he'd accomplished as executor of government plans, administrator of districts. But most of all, as a trustee of reliquaries, regent of ancient remains, the textures of time, defaced statues, desiccated manuscripts, patinaed masonry, had most excited his ardor, aroused his care. These he collected, cherished, preserved for the citizenry as hooks and links to our discontinuous heritage. He reached back into time, pulling out skeins and swatches and derelict, exquisite clumps into the light of our ordinary day. For this, he was most remembered. Second one is called Requiem. Honor him. Himself inevitably altered, irre, sorry, honor him, himself inevitably, irreversibly altered by time. The count of years pleated the textures of his skin, dimmed his eyes, and filled them with salt moisture. pulled down sags of flesh from his fine bones. Dilettante antiquarian, gifted collector, who sifted the alluvial layers of our past, unearthing motives meaning out of ruins, who turned a personal passion to public heritage, honor him. Remember him for all he did and all that perhaps he retreated from doing. 
join the lean rows of those who want him. Few have ventured all he had, or so failed, short of mastery. Honor him. Third one is called Visual. In the shifting breezes of an August night, trunks of moon-silvered poplar undulate between jasmine shrubs. In the park, near where, tangled in tubes, pin-cushioned with needles, wired into circuitries of sensors and monitors, he scrabbles for breath on a hospital bed. Sit by me as I keep the night time visual, keep this night time visual. More parent than son now, I regard the dwindled form of the bed, the thin feet. The fourth one is called After the Funeral. The next day brought silence, <coughs> as his mourners conferred him to the dust of his dreams. In a darkness fragrant with leaves, they returned wordless between gravestones and trunks of oak mulberry. They recalled as they filed from the unspeaking grave his gift of conversation that, twist, that twined the listener in webs of words, ideas, concepts. Re recollected the effulgence of an overarching mind, spirit, remembered his patterns of love, of rage. Some few of us wept at how those passions had been stilled in a derelict body. Mourned the transformation of his wit to winds of complaint, punctuating long silences. We had observed his mind turn inward and away somewhere, as in stricken muteness he contemplated the pain, the gracelessness of his ordeal. Number five, Elegy. For three years, locked in silence, he'd explored the structures of his success and unsuccess. He'd conjured in his head continuing arcs of moments, events, places, people, relived within himself his many triumphs and also his omissions and fallings short. His failure to find in his books mastery of the universe his two disordered marriages, and his desolate, angered children. Pity him not his months of suffering. The dead need no pity. Honor instead the fastidiousness of his long, exacting re-examination. There is nothing further. Judgment is completed. Honor him. I remember her in my childhood years, sleeping in dark corners where the rats chew the Gary sacks in our little hot room, or on wooden chairs in the green darkness, or on cement platforms near the gutter of the unforgiving street through the unhappy nights and the suffering years. The remembrance rouses in me dreams of strength and dreams of fear. I watch over her as she gently sleeps. 
The soft dreams flutter her eyelids. Her quiet breathing and the blessedness of kindly eyes that are shut tight and the parted lips soothe my anxious soul. She is travel weary and has found her son. How patiently she stayed awake all those years watching over us in our heaving, worrisome sleep of childhood, watching our future become our past. Now that she sleeps in my battered armchair, I know that she dreams well. I am watching over her. My turn has come round at last. Yes, glory. A heavy heart is the title of the poem. I finally understood that the heart is a box. I can empty its sorrow and fill it up with joy. Whenever I wish, I don't always succeed. At times it becomes too heavy to carry. So I put it aside and lean on it. And then I get up and carry it again. To be fair, there are times when it's quite light. It spreads its wings and soars, reminding me that I am its nest. But these are the requisite illusions for a poem. The truth is this. The heart is a long shelf stacked with heavy boxes. No wings, just dust and pain. I lied again, for the poem's sake, of course. But since we are approaching the last few lines, I will come clean. I know nothing about your hearts, but I do know that mine is an old palace. So vast, I used to wander and get lost in it. But today, its rooms and corners are stacked with hundreds of boxes. There is not much space left except for this narrow spot by the gate where I squat and write this poem. slept badly. <laughs> slept quite badly. Worked all morning. Loved the view from your window. Jewels scattered in the night. I want to see the view from your heart. Magic connections will abound. High force set in motion in spite of what you think. High force set in motion. Connecting above and below. Above in the unseen, below in the unknown. 
I drift in and out of your essence, reading the runes of your soul, different inside from outside, learning a new language of your faraway breathing, destiny changing with those secret lines running through all the webs far beyond the sphere of time, where the ones who see beyond our realm see when the true genesis of touch will bear astounding fruit. Only how to be ready when the dove hovers over the unwilling mind must you yield up the millennial ideas of sacrifice. They know there is no sacrifice where there is love, just a giving and an altar offering without a name and without a measure. Who can measure the view from your heart? I sit at its window, and the enigma of the twilight city makes sense to me as the wind, as the movement of the wind does over the face of the seas. Watch the links multiply till a flower is formed. Can you give birth to a flower? Can you give birth to the new self forming from the enigma, a clear form, mysterious to behold? beautiful as the dawn over those mountains? What is magic to touch and to give birth to worlds? To dream and for the real to be in doubt? To love and become calm so that all becomes clear like the evanescent form of an angel? Slept pretty badly, worked all morning. All I have is a certain gaze of yours and the way when leaving you take all of you with you and me at the window dreaming. I want to see the view from your heart. It's called April. When the plain is bare of trees, there are no retreats, no green shelters, only sand and shaking red rock. Here nature has been niggardly, hard bitten. Only a few spiky plants struggle up to shrubs. There is bitter water rising to the roots. The source of the trail is at the roots. These images harden a wheel on the, on the consciousness. But how to articulate them? How express and by expressing expunge? The poem does not come naturally of itself, not anymore. Help me bring it out. It seems so hard now. Was it so clear before? Or is there only less to say? Here, are 200 terse smiles stretch to the snarling faces of mountains. Old, eroded mountains split and cracked through cutting edges. Winds caught between the crags whirl themselves pointlessly around and around. Loose rooted shrubs sometimes tumble from shale shoulders. The source of betrayal is the soil where the seed fell. The task revolves around these images and their articulation, but it is hard to know whether you have written the intended poem or something else altogether. Uh, may I please request the audience to remain seated? We began 10 minutes late, so uh, technically we still have another five minutes. 
there are, I know, several young people, students in the audience uh, who uh, are, going to, are familiar with the poem that I have requested Ben Oakley to read. Okay, this poem I've been read that I've, I've been requested to read is called An African Energy. And it's the title of the poem of my first volume of poems. Can you just wait a second? Um. <laughs> We are the miracles that God made to taste the bitter fruit of time. We are precious, and one day our suffering will turn into the wonders of the earth. There are things that burn me now which turn golden when I'm happy. Do you see the mystery of our pain? that we bear poverty and are able to sing and dream sweet things, and that we never curse the air when it is warm, or the fruit when it tastes so good, or the lights that bounce gently on the waters. We bless things even in our pain. We bless them in silence. That is why our music is so sweet. It makes the air remember. There are secret miracles at work that only time will bring forth. I too have heard the dead sing, and they tell me that this life is good. They tell me to live it gently, with fire, and always with hope. There is wonder here, and there is surprise in everything the unseen moves. The ocean is full of songs, the sky is not an enemy. Um, I don't suppose there are any questions. There isn't any time now for questions, but I think what? Yes? Maybe one question. <laughs> Sorry, for me? Yeah. Well, the, the poem, different readers interpret it very differently. Would you please uh, guide us in this regard? What is the uh, correct? Interpretation of a poem. Uh, yes. Please, thank you. Uh, which one? Uh, what is the uh, correct interpretation of a poem? Because different readers uh, interpret uh, a poem differently. Yeah. See. So, oh, so, they don't know. What is the correct interpretation of a poem, right? Yeah, which one? The last one I read. No. The first one I read. There isn't, there isn't a correct interpretation of poetry. There can never be a 100% correct interpretation. Even, I, the, even the poet cannot give you a correct interpretation of the poem. <laughs> Look, the poet has written something, put it out there, but now you, it's going to communicate to you. Because the poem exists between the poet and the reader, between yeah. the poet and the world, between the page and the heart. Okay. Okay. interpretations as their hearts to interpret the poem. And in any case, a poet may set out to do something, and the uh, reader may see something else entirely different. Thank you all for being here. It's been lovely sharing thoughts.